What is going on, you guys? It's your boy, Modern Day Diogenes here. And we're back with uh, episode 28, I believe. I need, to, I need to stop, like, counting these off because I uh, I, I just lose track of, of what number I'm on. And I it's just not even worth it at this point. But anyway, yeah, we're back. I haven't done one of these in a while, so probably a little, a little rusty. So we'll, uh, we'll see. Um... I actually forgot what the hell I was doing. Whatever. Um, yeah, a little rusty, so um, maybe have some... Uh, knock the rust off a bit and um, see if I can't dive into some interesting topics today. Great start. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Looking over at my list already. Um, yeah, I want to talk about midlife crisis. The concept of the midlife crisis. I'd love to uh, like interview some people who had gone through one or have in some way experienced what um, you know what they call a midlife crisis, just to see, just to get a better definition of it, because I think that's part of my part of what my struggles will be in, in diving into this is is really defining what uh, the midlife crisis like, even is. Like, what is that? Um, but of course, with my limited um, knowledge of the topic, really, I'm just going to make some generalizations that maybe, maybe they might apply, they might not. I don't, I don't really care. Um, but uh, I think the crux of the midlife crisis is um, really like you. I guess in some way it has sunk in that life wasn't what you thought it was, type of thing. Um, and it's, it's generally not, it generally happens in the middle of your life. Cause I think that's when, um, like that's when you, you no longer have like the I'm young kind of excuse type of thing. Um, so, you know, whether it's a, like a career thing or like a family thing or, or whatever, generally it, you know, by the time you're, you know, if you're, if you're 28, you're like, Oh, I still have time. You know, it's still, I can still do all this stuff. And then really by the time you're like, 40, 45 or so, or like maybe even late 30s. Kind of really depends on like how healthy you are and whatever. But really, just like I guess the midpoint of your life, whatever that might be. Um, it comes a point in time where you're like kind of you can kind of see the end, maybe. Um, and I think one thing I have uh, heard about is the like the understanding of mortality when um, as like a common theme of people experiencing a life crisis is they. They realize that they're not going to be around forever, like they're going to die at some point. Um, and I'm not saying that I have a hard time conceptualizing that now, not being at the midlife crisis age. Um, but I think that's that is a, a theme that is I've I, I've at least heard of. Again, I, I'm not even know I'm sure, sure why I'm talking about this because I have no no direct experience having a midlife crisis. But I feel like I've had some crises in my life that you know, or on par really, like kind of this, not really an identity crisis, but a crisis of like, what the fuck's going on type of thing. So I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I have no room to speak on this, but I don't really care at, at this point. I'm, I've already started talking about it. Um, yeah, so I, I wonder if there's any like track to kind of, kind of avoid the crisis. Like I wonder if you talk to people who on paper at least had achieved all their dreams and what would that be like? So someone wanted to be a really famous actor or something, and they became a really famous actor, right? I feel like that. Then their midlife crisis isn't so much of like, oh, I didn't achieve my dreams. It's more so like I, they weren't what I weren't what I thought they were. But no matter what, it's just this juxtaposition between the like a subverted expectation and a or an expectation and a subverted reality. Really, is where kind of the whole. Uh, I don't even, what am I doing in the world right now? Oh my God. Um, it's really just kind of where this, where I think it all originates from. So again, I'm not really sure if I have any kind of um, like remedy to, uh, to for a midlife crisis. I, sp I suppose it really, it, it comes down to accepting mortality and to embrace and exercise autonomy as a thing 
right? So it, in some cases, I think it's people are stuck in their relationships and their jobs and their life. So they can't really exercise any form of like freedom from, not, not necessarily that they couldn't, like theoretically, they could just like get up and leave and, you know, forget about their whole life. But they're not going to because it's, you know, they have obligations and responsibilities and it, like, they don't have, like, a, what else would they be doing, really? Um, you know, so it's, I, I guess it's hard to, to say that they don't really have any choice. But in a, in a lot of ways, in most, in, in most other, other ways, they really don't have a choice in terms of what they can do. So they uh, kind of hunker down and go through a time of crisis while they, um, you know, I guess define a new normal for their life, whatever that may be. Or new normal for their expectations, not necessarily their life, because their life hasn't really changed externally. It'd just be their their perception of such has has changed. Um, and I don't know. I think it, I'm I'm curious to see what what kind of happens as you age, in terms of what you're like. Uh, you know, because generally older people aren't nearly as um, don't have the same ambition as younger people, and I wonder what whether like the loss of ambition is a function of just time like the older you are you just the less you want to do anything or it's a function of like realization that what you're able to do and what you're not able to do um because it's generally because you you learn easier and you do things better when you're younger um understandably so just because you have a limited amount of experience and so you there's not a lot you don't understand um so in, in getting older do you just kind of accept you know is it I guess do you lose the ambition and the ability to learn more as because you accept where you are and what you've done, or is it just a purely a function of time? And just the older you are, the more you just kind of uh, you know forget about stuff and you know kind of accept whatever whatever's going on at, at face value, right? Versus like the younger person is more this oh I'm gonna change this or I'm gonna learn this and do that. Um, you know they have a kind of all this motivation. And that just kind of fades as you get older, as you kind of settle into a, a routine. And, you know, here's, I guess this is finally getting into something that I, I feel like is, is important. People talk about routines a lot. And I really, I truly do value, like, routines. I think routines are super valuable. So, like, you know, your likelihood of doing something is a is strongly a function of how often you've done it before. Like, so how accustomed you are to doing such things. Like, if you stay up to 4 a.m. every night, you're going to get used to staying up to 4 a.m. and you're going to be up till 4 a.m., odds are, right? Um, you know, and then making a routine of going to bed early or eating vegetables or something, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. Like, that's, a lot of that is a function of a, of routine. So establishing routines, I think, is really important for, like, being healthy and whatnot. Um, on the other side of that, routines, a lot of times, tend to be what locks you into like I'm not saying anti-growth really but a uh like if you have these very well established routines you're a lot less likely to change things right so you're not you're less likely to implement any kind of new um thing um and i, I suppose when you're younger like you're still kind of establishing a lot of routines and so then you're like it's pretty dynamic like if you wanted to all of a sudden toss in you know five hours of practicing chess or something i don't know whatever weird thing that you want to learn you know as, as or a new language or something i don't know and you're it's easier to kind of you know just kind of throw that into your schedule because your your routines are less defined versus when you're 60 and you've been doing the same thing every day every week every year for years and years and years and years and years you're uh there's a sorry there's a fly going to kill it um you're a lot less likely to be able to just toss something in right toss a new thing in you know um to learn chess then so i wonder if it is like because routines kind of have that double-edged sword then you know so like they're good in the sense that you can establish good routines that um allow you to do things healthy and be consistent with everything right consistent in like your relationships and all that whatever whatever you want to define your consistency in diet exercise whatever that's just the, those are just the easy ones you think of um but it also might kind of harm you in the sense that you're less likely to 
you know, kind of expand your horizons, I guess, for lack of a better word, if you have these very, very strictly established routines. So I don't know, it's interesting. I, th I could certainly see both sides of the argument where, um, you know, routines are obviously super helpful for um, doing things. So I, I guess uh, striking a balance between having healthy routines and like some lack of routine, some irregularity to your routine. Um, it's especially like if you, if you want to make a change with your life, you need to like give up the routine. You need to not do something that you've been doing for a while. Um, you know, so giving up something and that's hard for people. Like, I think that's, that's even a big part of like addiction as a, a thing that people deal with. Um, it's not even that like the substance itself, yeah, is addictive, but it's like the routine part of it. It's the fact that it is a routine. So it's like, oftentimes it's the time of day and the place in which they have this addict. Like if you smoke a cigarette at your lunch break, every shift, right? Like if you switch jobs with, that doesn't even have a lunch break or has a different lunch break or a different location, you're probably going to be less likely to like continue that habit because you're no longer like the triggers aren't quite there. Right. And there's, that's a whole, there's a whole thing with addiction, like going down that rabbit hole, but I don't really, I don't want to go down that hole. I'm just thinking in terms of routine, um, you know, establishing a balance of like healthy routines that you want to upkeep. And then kind of enough chaos and enough mystery with um, your day-to-day, week-to-week life that you can't, that you, you're able to kind of put things down and pick something else up, right? Because one thing I always, uh, I never really liked about the, like the working, um, I, you know, I, I sound like a freaking Zoomer with this, but um, like working a very, very regular shifts, like going to work from nine to five, um, you know, traveling to the same spot, being with the same people, is it, it, it likens itself to this very, very repetitive, like, mindset. So, like, the weeks go by, the days go by. Like, the days are long, but the weeks are short, you know, where it's like, it's like nine to five feels grueling, but then, you know, when all of a sudden you get home and the whole week's over, and then it's like, you're just kind of flying through it. And if somebody's like, hey, man, you want to just drop everything and, like, go to Mexico for a week? You're like, well, no, I can't, obviously. I have to yeah, I've got work and I got this. And it's like, so then you, you kind of establish if you've, you know, if you fall into good habits and good, you'll just be kind of living in this little bubble of good routines over and over again. Um, but you'll kind of miss out on a lot of those new experiences because you're again, in this bubble of routine. So I think the routine needs, the routines need to consist of like uh, enough of the kind of the healthy repetitive things that should be in, that you should be doing but enough of like this chaos and uncertainty so that you're able to just be like, oh yeah, fuck it, I don't, let's do it. And that's why like, I think the prospect of working like uh, like from home or on your own hours is, is very appealing to a lot of the, maybe some of the younger generation, not only because you don't have to like, you know, the kind of the prospect, I mean, the nine to five job has been shit on endlessly and I don't even think it's that bad. I just think it's got such a negative connotation right now that everyone, it's like a punching bag. Everyone can just take a shit on nine to five jobs, but they're honestly not even that bad. There's a, there's a lot of benefits I think to that routine, um, depending on how you your work style and how you like doing work and stuff like that. But either way, I think what's really appealing about the, like the new age of work with this remote work and things is that you're able to kind of bake in more of this like, oh like yeah I'll just go visit somebody kind of spontaneous thing. And I think that's really nice and I, and it also comes down to didn't really boil down but there's a this is a piece of it is um like the like spontaneity right i think people generally fall on some spectrum of spontaneity either you're someone that is like you know spontaneous almost to a fault where you're just like if it's you'll do anything once kind of thing right and if you know you're down to you know get hammered and stay up till 6 a.m. and, you know, run, you know, so it's like, yeah, sure, let's do it. And they're like, no matter what, they always just say yes. Um, versus people who like, won't even try like, you know, I don't know, a new cup of coffee or something like that. You know, like, you know what I mean? People that are very, very resistant to change. There's definitely like a spectrum of it. So I think part of this whole conversation would be like thinking about where you fall on the spontaneity spectrum and, 
where you fall in like your routine spectrum. If you're someone that is terrible at all routines, you have no routines for anything. Like you might even want to like take the advice of people that are like uber routine, but someone that like me, who's more routine based, um, who's, you know, I mean, I don't even know where I fall in this, honestly. So I, I'm not even the person to be giving advice here, but, um, either way, I, I think being aware and understanding of how spontaneous you are and then what routines you've established and you can't establish. And then, um, I don't know, kind of use that to, the, to, um, advise your work structure, um, you know, so that you're obviously not a piece of shit doing nothing all day, you know, because, oh, I'm just waiting for things to come up, I'm spontaneous, and it's like, oh, you don't have a job, like, you know what I mean, um, you gotta be doing something, so you, I think you definitely need to have some routines, but it's definitely a balance, you know, people that have their whole day scheduled to, not even their whole day, like, because I have my whole day scheduled sometimes, but, like, their whole, like, life, like, five years, ten years, months weeks hours like it's all time down to the minute um i think that's not that's not really a good way to live there should be some amount of chaos kind of thrown into the mix right where you can just be like you can kind of scratch off you know something and the way i plan it is i have a tentative plan for the way i expect things to go but i also am very very open to just like trashing my plan um you know so if i have like this whole day planned out and, you know, for the most part, there's not things that I have to do. It's not like I'm going to miss a deadline or something on these days. Like, generally, I don't I don't miss those. But, um, you know, if there's something comes up that I don't, I can just, if I'm able just to cross everything else off and go, all right, fuck it, let's just do this. Um, you know, I try to keep that as a, keep that in my, uh, like, keep that as an option. And don't, don't like, let that fly away. Because I think that's really good. And I think you lose a lot of that when you get older and you get a family and get established. Um, you kind of, you know, that's where you lose all your friends. Not you don't lose all your friends, but you like forget about a lot of your friends and, you know, things kind of, um, you know, get really repetitive and all of a sudden a lot of time has passed. So especially if you want to kind of soak and enjoy time, I think part of it is, is you know, having routines that are good that's going to keep you alive longer. That's like one thing, but then... Also, just keeping enough chaos in the mix, right? Having some spontaneity and being okay with just trying something that's, like, totally not in your comfort zone, which is obviously easier said than done. Like, you know, who am I to come up here and bark about this shit? I'm not, you know, I don't, what do I know? But uh, even that's just what I, what I kind of, it's my opinion, so that's what that's what it is. Whatever, I don't give a fuck. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, yeah. Yeah, anyway, I, I think part of where this kind of comes in to other things that are on my list here um, is, like, I don't know, I, uh, the world's a pretty big place, and they say, oh, it's a small world, and like, yeah, like, you run into people like that, but there's still, there's a lot of stuff, like, just things, places to go, things to try, and, and even you know, kind of further along that, there's a lot of different people out there, different types of people, different, like, occupations, different, you know, and that varies by geography and things like, you know, so you see people that travel all the time, and yeah, I'm not, I don't want to romanticize traveling, because as if it's some big thing, because I, I have beef with that as a, like, ideology to people that just think that the world should be, you should just travel, and just travel, and travel, and travel, and like, it's not all about fucking traveling, all right, like, a lot of the stuff, you know, at least if you live in the United States, um, a lot of places, like, you know, maybe, or Canada, too, a lot of other places, like, you should be glad that you go to the United States, like, there's a reason that people are trying to immigrate here, because it's, like, just better, so some places are just shit, so it's not like, um, you know, traveling is, like, all, you know, all typed up to be, and a lot of times, I've, I've always said it's not the place, it's the people, so, like, would I rather be, you know, in Cancun with my worst enemy, or in some shitty log cabin with, like, five of my best buds like obviously the log cabin i don't even matter i don't care where it is it could be behind a dumpster um it'd be more fun than to be in you know cabo with some douchebag i don't like you know um and i think people forget about that they just think it's oh this is awesome place i'm gonna steal get a free trip to hawaii it's like a free trip to hawaii but you don't like them so it's like you know it's stupid um anyway um, I forgot the fuck I was talking about. Oh, part of what the spontaneity like allows 
opens for you in terms of opportunities. It allows you to discover more of what type of people are out there. Not really necessarily, not necessarily about what like stuffs out there. Like, yeah, you can go see the some old Greek amphitheater. And, you know, you can go see these cool stuff. Like, yeah, you're probably going to forget about it. You take some pictures. Like, that's whatever. But I think the another the important part is to get more of an idea of what kind of people are out there. So it, um, you know, it, it kind of always surprises me that people travel and then like. They just go like sightseeing, like for the sights. But I think part of, if you're going to travel at all, like part of it should be like the different cultures and the different like people. Because people are very, very different in um, geographical areas too. And not even just like what, yeah, like what they eat and what they wear is different. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking more of on a philosophical level, right? Like what do they, you know, how do they think? How do they operate? And maybe that's just me kind of being a psychoanalyzer. I like to probe in that area and kind of get a sense of the mentality of, of, of people um, that you know and that's I think it's really different even in a small local area like there's people that think wildly differently I think those that's always more interesting to me than like seeing some old building like I don't care like you know for the most part like it's, it's what is it special because it was built like 5,000 years ago or something I don't it doesn't really matter like I that like whatever um, I don't know I'd never got too excited about shit like that but anyway yeah um i think that's that's an important part of uh like being spontaneous is is interacting with different types of people because i think part of the routine that drives people crazy into this midlife crisis mode is they talk and interact with the same people over and over and over again and they're just like these people have the same ideas the same conversations the same fucking everything every fucking day and it drives him nuts and you know rightfully so i think that 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 would drive anyone crazy so i think part of the you know maybe avoiding or stifling a midlife crisis of sorts is to um you know interact with new people constantly right um and and i think that becomes hard to do once you hit a certain age where you're no longer you know you're no longer surrounded by new people where you can meet new people right um so I don't know. I'm not sure if there's any great foolproof way of really always like meeting new people at every age. I think it really changes based on age. Like you can always join like even if you're 70, you can join a bingo club or something. Um, but you know, I I think I think there's you know even challenges with other people. Like other other people also have to buy into this like willingness to meet and talk and introduce themselves, right? Which generally decreases over time. Like you know, when you're young and you're a kid, you are introduced to everyone all the time. You're always meeting people, new names, new faces, new ideas. Um, And as you get older, you just kind of grow weary of meeting new people, I guess, you know, which is fair, but I think it's still uh, important to kind of keeping your head on straight and not going crazy, you know, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, Yeah, so I guess more on the idea of uh, like the anti-work establishment which again i don't really completely buy into as a as as an ideology i think there's there's obviously like as with most most things it's like they're right about some stuff some stuff is overlooked um but uh i I think a better answer instead of you know we want higher pay and more flexible hours and we want to work from home and you know I want the ability to jerk off on my Zoom meeting without any repercussion. Like, you shit like that. You know, it's fucking stupid. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think part of the, the answer on a more business side of things would be to um, no longer prioritize growth to the same extent. Like, I think businesses as a, in, in general, it's not even that they prioritize revenue, like, in the short term. They just prioritize growth in the short term and they'll grow in whatever way they can and acquiring new customers, whatever way they can. But I think as a, uh, like as a, um, as a, uh, like a monetary or economic structure, economic was the one I was, the word I was looking for an economic structure. I think it, um, you know, prioritizing growth is great for kind of short term, more like band aid innovations. Versus like kind of these deeper, like more impactful innovations. So maybe there's more innovation happening like in this short term lens, but I I don't see the same like long term, like big time thinking, like 10 year 
scale um, amount of innovation occurring. And I think part of that is because um, businesses and, and, you know, at least investors' money is following like growth, just growth, 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 growth. That's all they care about. So I think one answer to that on like the macroscopic scale would be to to, to stop prioritizing um, growth. Um, and, and, and growth obviously has meet different meanings in different contexts. But I, I just mean like, uh, you know, getting a billion users in your platform and just getting like volume versus like quality. Um, and I think it, in general, like uh, you could simplify it. And I, I don't, obviously it's a gross simplification, but you can simplify it all to um, stop prioritizing quantity over quality. Because, um, you know, you see nowadays that like competition is not um, like the modern day competition in the economic market isn't like quality products competing with quality products. And, and, and obviously in some sectors it is like, you know, I think there's like there's, you know, like in terms of the in phone manufacturers, right, those are generally quality like, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, Google makes great phones, but generally speaking, they make. Apple makes really high quality phones. They make quality, phones. you know, like they make. There's some quality in there, but I think a lot of sub markets and a lot of smaller areas that are kind of growing really fast are they're just crap, crappily. They're crap products competing with other crap products, and everyone like just wants to get into the market as fast as they can, get market share as fast as they can. But they don't ever prioritize making like quality products. It's just about like making a product and then just like getting it as big as it, you can. But it's like a shit product. No one fucking wants it. Um, and that's the, everyone, all the competition in the market is all shit products, right? Whereas I think and that's rewarded in the short term. And then these companies go under like, oh, what, what, what went wrong? It's like, well, you just, like you're purchasing growth so much that you forgot that your product is garbage or it was just unnecessary. And everyone in your, like everyone in, this, in the field or in the same market was doing the same thing because they were competing for growth and just numbers. When in reality, someone, you know, I think the long game, the smart play would have been to make a better product. And maybe, yeah, you're not going to, maybe you sacrifice the short term market share. Um, but I think in the long term, you'll, those shitty products, they fizzle out. They don't last forever. Maybe the last 10 years, but they do not last forever. Um, and so I don't know. I think, I think part of what would, could assist maybe the anti work, um, agenda i suppose is to for corporations um and i mean on the individual level too but corporations in general to um to not prioritize uh growth for a time right maybe prioritize stability or you know product quality and i think that's obviously like an impossible ask no one's going to do that but um but even that i think that would be uh that would start to remedy the kind of this like rapid rapid growth we've seen because i think growth is good but like very very rapid growth is unstable a lot of times and i think we're seeing kind of the the fallout from that so if you wanted um if you wanted like a a, a very a strong economy it's it's going to be cyclical right you're going to have periods where it's you're prioritizing growth and periods where you're prioritizing stability i just think we we never really shifted into stability and it kind of takes a we have to get into a recession before we're, we've prioritized stability. So it's like it, first, you know, it always kind of takes that, right? We, we, you know, grow like crazy. Um, don't, you know, everything's blowing up and then all of a sudden everything keeps falling apart because we're still trying to grow, 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 grow. And then we go into recession and, you know, stability kind of comes back and then, um, and then we'll go into another recession of growth. So I'm not saying to like, permanently stifle growth you know as a way to just put a cap on innovation i'm just thinking um you know we should shift modes like it, it'll be cyclical it's naturally cyclical but um if you want to avoid recessions there has to be a a point in time and it's you know obviously it's an impossible ask unless you're a, like the federal government like working with 10,000 iq ahead of time but for the most part like switching from uh, switching from growth to um, to stability is is where you can avoid the recession, but obviously that's not going to happen. So anyway, we'll get we'll the recession will cause a, a brief period of stability, or I'm sorry, not the st- the recession itself will be terrible, but um, after the recession, kind of the picking up the pieces, the fallout will be a period of stability, 
And then, I, you know, in however many years, five years or one year or 10 years, I don't know, there'll be another period of like rapid, crazy growth. Um, and then we'll go into another recession. It's kind of the cyclical pattern that I've been seeing at least. And I'm sure there's some economics textbook that, you know, probably explains a lot of this in, in detail and actually has more to say on this, like some numbers to back it up. This is just all speculative in, in my like limited understanding and knowledge of economics, macroeconomics, but that's just kind of what I, what I see as a thing. And I think, um, kind of the anti-workers would get more, um, we get some of the things that they're demanding if they, uh, if there's a period of stability, I think that would be, that'd be nice. I think people, people like that. Like growth is really nice and exciting. It's, you know, growth is exciting. It's good, but it's, um, you know, it also comes with, uh, with times like this where it's like a recession and everyone's fucking losing their jobs and crying and whatever. I don't know. Whatever. I don't know. That's my, I'm not a fucking economist. I don't know shit about this, but I'm just, you know, this is just what I think. So probably wrong. I don't care. So go fuck yourself. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'm gonna take a drink of, uh, water. Anyway, um, something else that, um, uh, isn't, I guess it just kind of frustrates me, I guess. Like, I could use that word, I suppose, but um, that's a pretty pretty weak uh, weak way of phrasing it. But, um, uh, you know, it, we tend to, like, label, like, oh, like, smart people as, like, oh, they're smart. Um, and I don't necessarily think that's bad. Obviously, I think I have some, I have some beef with just, like, smart as an idea, right? I think I talked about that before, where, like, what smart is what? Like, doing good in school? Like, no, I don't think that's being smart. Um, or is it making you a bunch of money? Like, no, that doesn't make you smart either. Um, smart really, um, you know, you could se- you could separate it more accurately by, like, by field. So, like, someone who really understood physics intuitively would be smart, I guess, at physics. But that doesn't mean that they know anything about anything else, right? They would, you know, they could go their whole life a freaking virgin like Newton Right, Newton was not smart when it came to the female anatomy. Right, um, <laughs> I just like roasting Newton. Um, but anyway, it's it's like it's it's all really dependent on like what field we're you know we're talking about when we talk about smart. And I, I suppose I don't I don't like that as a like mentality like oh you're smart. Um, and I think part of the problem is that you assign responsibility to like perceived intelligence. So um, if somebody is considered smart by their peers and at school or they get good grades and they're like constantly being affirmed that they're they're smart they they kind of have this implicit responsibility to be to do something with their smarts like if somebody who is you know this perfect valedictorian super genius and they're like "Eh, i'm just gonna be a barista you know they're like what the fuck bro what are you doing like you wasted all your like potential so it's like you can't even if you wanted to just kind of like do something that you enjoy that's like pretty easy, like you can't because you have a responsibility and obligation to not waste your talents, right? Um, Which is unfortunate if you're someone who's really, really good at physics and you want to be a barista. Um, You know, like you should be the person working on physics because you're good at it, right? Um, And this doesn't come up as often as maybe I'm thinking it does, but uh, you know, because oftentimes you get good, you're good at something because you like it, and then it's this feedback loop. But some people are just good at stuff that they don't like, <laughs> um, and they you know don't want to do it for a living. They just they've only done it to this point because they were good at, it and everyone kept barking at them, telling them to do it. Um, so I, you know, but yeah, there's a certain sense of responsibility. Yeah, and then the other thing is it it is it, it serves as this great excuse for people who just don't want to do anything um, or just want to pawn stuff off. Right. So, you know, you hear it kind of with like manager is like, oh, you know, like some or a business head is talking to some tech guy and it's like, oh, well, you're you're smarter than me with this stuff. So you go on and do it, you know, and some of it's just a lazy excuse to not wanting to do it yourself. So, you know, especially if you call somebody smart, it, it feels like it's this great end to like get them to do something for you. Um, so you're like, oh, I need help with something. I know you're a really smart guy, so you can help me. Um, like, fuck you, F- like, actually fuck you, because I don't, like, it's, first of all, like, a lot of times, whatever they're asking you to do and flattering you with isn't even hard, they just want to, they just don't want to do it, they're just lazy, 
um, you know, and they expect to, if they just call you smart, like if it's going to be some, it's going to be okay now, right? It's like, say, oh, I said you were smart. So like you should be easy for you. Like, I think smart as, as that label is, is just a lazy, stupid way of just like not wanting to do something. Because a lot of times like what, what they're calling smart is like, just like a, a menial root task that could easily be learned by a monkey that is it's just not even hard at all. Um, so I'm trying to think of a good example here. Like I had, I had people that asked me for like help with like Excel or something um, as an example. Um, they're like, oh, can you, I need to make a graph. Can you help me? Yeah, you're smart, you're a smart guy. You can help me with Excel, right? No, I haven't memorized all of the Excel graphing functions. And I don't know the assignment you're working on. I don't know any of that. And what you're saying I'm smart at is looking at some numbers, like picking the two axes that you want, and then like looking up the graphing function. Like I could you could write a robot really to help them with what they're doing. But the point in that being that it's a very like it's not like a high level creative like design a system from scratch. You're talking about something very, very rudimentary, like in logic. And it's just a matter of like kind of struggling with a problem a little bit. So just like not just giving up and pawning it off to someone else. Um, through like, oh you're smart, help me. Um, so it's just you're just lazy. I'm not it's not even that you're stupid, you're lazy. Um, and so I think I think a big like a huge piece of being smart, I guess, in the traditional academic sense. I kind of have beef with just the idea of smarts as a whole. I think it's a stupid, it's a stupid premise to run around and call people smart. Um, but part of it is just not being lazy, like <laughs> being able to just kind of wrestle with problems and not just like throw your hands up and pawn off someone else because you don't want to do it. Like, spoiler alert, I don't want to do your Excel work either. It's like, it's bitch work. It's annoying. I don't know what the fuck it is. It's like I'm not in, you know, if it's, it's, if it's for class, I'm not in your class. If it's for your job, I don't work your job. Like, pay me your salary then if I'm going to do it for you. So it's like just this mentality of being stupid. I think that's the only people that use, like, that call people smart. I don't think people that, you know, are considered smart ever run around calling other people smart because they know that most of the time it's not even being smart. It's just not being lazy and just being okay with, like, figuring stuff out because it's not hard. It's really not hard. It's just... Do you have the patience to Google something and kind of try to figure it out, look at it, you know, think about it for a second, right? Versus just like, oh, this is not blatantly obvious to me. It's not just a big green button in front of me. You know, it's not as mindless as playing Minecraft. So I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, no, it's like, you think anything is that fucking easy? You think you think that's how, how it is for all of like us smart people is that we can just blink and all of a sudden we understand everything? No, I just, I don't understand most of the shit I do all the time, but you just have to have some patience to figure it out. And really part of it is understanding that shit's not that fucking hard. It's really not. It's most of the time, most of the time it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, under, it's just under some layers of complexity and it, and it's just, it's a, I don't know. It's an excuse for just being lazy. So I don't ever call somebody smart or for someone who's like, no, I, I think that it's just a, it's not something I do or I think is useful for anyone. It's just, you know, flattering someone. Oh, you're smart, so do this for me. Like, no, you're just lazy. Um, I'm not smart, you're lazy. It's a difference. Um, anyway, I just, I hate that as a a thing that people do. Um, is just to, uh, you know, pawn work off to people. So if that's the key to being a manager. I'm not going to be a very good manager because that's like, oh, you're, I got all these smart people to do all this work for me. It's like, first of all, the shit they're doing is not require any level of intelligence. It requires patience. Um, and you're just lazy and not impatient. So you just, you know, can flatter people and get them to do it for you. So I don't know. I hate that as a thing, you know, running around. So anyway, what's next? Ah, yes. Um, so I've talked about this general generational gap before, like the the uh, the older generation always th- like looks at the new generation as like uh, we're fucked. Like these 
these kids of, you know, they're crazy, you know. Um, and of course, their fathers and mothers said the same thing. Um, and you know, they don't, you know, you know, God save us. The world is going to be, is going to be, is going to blow up after these kids take over or whatever. Um, and you know, I, I think every generation says that it's a very cyclical pattern where. Um, the older generation says, oh, we're screwed. These kids, you know, don't know how to change an engine or something or some some boomer take. Uh, and, you know, to to a certain extent, obviously, I, I think it's going to be the same thing. You know, people look at the people our age now and go, what a bunch of idiots. They're not going to figure anything out. And then when the next generation of kids come around, like the the kid the kids growing up right now, like I look at even – just as a young adult, and I'm like, these people are fucked, like, we're screwed, um, so I wonder whether, and I'm, I think it's obviously a lot of the same mentality, where it's, it's not going to be as bad as I think, there are kids out there who are doing awesome things, and you really only take note, and get discouraged at the shitty ones who are, like, truly doing dumbass stuff, but there's, you know, there's plenty of kids nowadays doing, like, really awesome, like, stuff, and they're going to be the ones that kind of take over, and lead us in the right direction um but what does kind of give me a little bit of hesitation and kind of writing it off as just this cyclical pattern of like kind of hating and thinking the next generation is worse is that the generation like the millennial generation now and the gen z generation are they're like they're not they're less happy than than the generation above them um and, and i think that I'm not, I'm not, I would love to look at the patterns, like, statistically, because I realize it is kind of a really, really hard thing to, to, uh, to measure, like, how, what, what, how, what is hap, what does that even mean? Um, but, um, I, I would imagine that even, like, the, the boomer generation, like, is, they live a better life than the generation above them, right? And they were generally happier, they've made more money, they've done better, just as the, gener- like, each generation has done better, right? But seeing that, like, a lot of the millennials don't make as much money as their parents and they are not as happy, like, it kind of begs the question, you know, like, well, were, were they right that this generation was screwed? And, and if so, what does that mean for, like, the generation growing up now? You know, where I look at them and I'm like, dude, we're fucked. Like, um, you know, one of my friends called them the, uh, the iPad generation, the generation that is has been raised by just iPads. Because for, as parents, it's easier just to, stuff an iPad in front of them and let them learn that way and engage that way. And I think about what a terrible upbringing that would be. And the kid would be unaware. Obviously the kid would just love to see all the colors and the music and the apps and whatnot, but to miss out on all of the like face to face, like human to human interaction that goes into actually raising and and growing up to that be replaced by, you know, an iPad is a terrifying thought. Um, and to me, uh, that, that's why I'm, that's part of the reason that I'm worried is I know that there's going to be, it's not going to be majority. Obviously there's parents out there doing wonderful, like doing their best work, but I think you're going to get a big divide. I think it, we've seen a divide even in like the generation. Now you have, um, you know, you have kind of this, um, you know, obviously I, and economics is one way to draw the lines where it's like, you know, there's very, very economically divided in terms of class. Like you have people you have rich families that have stayed rich who have done good parenting and have good education and those those people are pumping out more kids that are going to have good education good kids whatever but i think the the part the issue is in the the mobility aspect of it right the the uh, poor families are getting poorer with worse education and all this stuff um so it's not even that necessarily that there's uh there's not going to be any people to to run the world because i think there is going to be i just think there's going to be more like bots for lack of a better word more npcs just kind of floating around like um controlled by the other people and if the you know and if the kind of the ruling class has a very um you know kind of medieval ideology they could they're very easy to control like dumb people dumb poor people are like very very easy to control i guess from a you know if you're looking at it from like putin's perspective or something right um, you'd want to have like a, a very, very educated, strong, like upper class. And you, you'd want to have like 
a super dumb, useless, like lower class that all they're doing is just buying stuff for you and just like kind of feeding into whatever products and craft that you're making. Um, and that'd be like a recipe to, you know, have a shitty, for a shitty world is just to have like these two classes really. Um, and, uh, and so, and so I'm, I'm, I'm worried that there is, there will be more of a divide um, between, especially between classes in, in the next generations. Because we, we've already seen kind of that happen, right? We've seen, uh, uh, you know, this, this very, this growing divide economically, but I think even socially in terms of development, we'll have um, people that, you know, were, were given a kind of a normal upbringing. I'll put normal in quotes there, but um, a normal, like healthy upbringing, people that were raised by iPads. And then, you know, you know where, where's that going to leave? <laughs> where's that going to leave those people, right? Um, and, you know, and you know, kind of the 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 uh, you know monarch deep inside me is like, oh well, fuck them, they're stupid, like it's their own fault, you know. You know, I you know, I feel like I, you know, if I was a kid being raised by the iPad, obviously I would, I'd be, I'd have the self awareness to not be, you know, <laughs> to run away or something. And I'd love to, you love to say that, but obviously it's not true. You just fall in fall in place like with everything else. But um, you know, there's there's a lot of potential that you're just leaving on the table there for. For, for those iPad generation kids, um, and uh, you know, part of me worries that it'll it'll become more just this, um, you know, become more like uneven as it was in back in <laughs> old 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 days when uh, there were very very two very very distinct separate classes. So I don't know. It's it's definitely a um, a concerning thought to think that the boomers were right about how shitty everything is. Um, or how shitty the generation is, but again, I don't think they're talking about everyone. I think they're just talking about the um, the bottom of the bar, right? So, like, I think people at the top, like, I think we have, like, each generation is going to have pe- people higher up at the top, like, even better than the previous generation. And those are going to be people that are going to be responsible for everything, right? Kind of the people on the the top edge, you know, the smart ones that are going to be responsible for doing everything, but then. You know, is the bottom of the bar going farther down too? Right? Are, we, are people getting worse? Um, so are we kind of stretching on both axes? I think that's more accurately where, like, what I'm talking about. I don't so so much to me to say is like we're shifting the average down. We're just kind of increasing the standard deviation a little bit. So to put that in in math terms, and if you're not a math person, I'm sorry, but um, yeah, you can think of it as just the average is staying the same, but the range is getting just a lot larger. And so you're, yeah, you're getting people that are smarter and more capable and whatever, but you're also getting more people like in terms of volume that are just dumber um, and just doing less stuff. Um, it's more distributed along this larger axis, which maybe it's maybe it's not the end of the world, but um, you know you worry if you know it kind of ends up separating itself naturally into two distinct classes, which um, I would view as as concerningly, right? I wouldn't, I'm not. I don't love the idea of uh, two very, very distinct, like the haves and the have-nots type of thing. So it smells very dystopian to me, so that's, that's I guess that's why. So I don't know. Maybe I'm just being too, being too alarmist here, but um, I certainly don't don't call any of it out of question, right? I think it's it's not unreasonable to, to think so, but it's I think my concerns are, are very much ahead of their time in, in the sense that it's not anything to to cry and run around in circles about right now right it's nothing to go crazy about it's just a kind of a concerning forethought maybe in 20 years um but uh but yeah i don't know i don't know am, am i being too crazy or too alarmist i think there's the tendency now to kind of over dramatize and and you know hyper sensationalize everything to make it very um, like oh no you know click on this <laughs> for clickbait purposes but uh, you know I you know there's a good part of me that, that worries for the, the future but I, I know that there's an, gonna be enough very very smart people um, to to take over and uh, you know of course I called them smart after saying how stupid that was but people that are capable and gonna you know the, the, I don't think the human species is doomed you know I think some people get um, people that think that, that that is the case is I 
I, I don't really see the merit there that you know humans as a whole are, are going to die. I think there's going to be plenty of people that are able to to hold their own and and keep uh, and keep the glue together. I just think there's going to be maybe more volatility and more uncertainty in a lot of different areas, and in a lot of ways that's not uh, it's not ideal. Um, but um, I don't know. What are you going to do? I guess. But, uh, but yeah. yeah, anyway, that's that's my thoughts. Um, I guess I'll just wrap it up there because I'm kind of at a stopping point. I don't want to go too far in detail. And there is a, there's a fly flying around. This has been the stupidest thing. This is the last thing I'll say. It's been the stupidest thing. It's like the last week in my room, there's been one fly at a time. So there's a fly. They're not that fast because I can catch them. So a fly will just be buzzing around my face, and I'll kill it. I'll, like, have the corpse on my hand. And then I'm like, all right, cool, that, that guy should be dead, right? It's over. There's only one. I, there wasn't like there's a swarm of flies. There's one fly. And then, like, you know, a couple hours later, another one spawns, right? Out of nowhere. And I'm like, what the fuck? I, I thought I just fucking killed this one. So I killed it again, and there's a new one. And it's happened, like, probably ten times now where just a new fly has spawned in, like, every, every ten minutes. And it's been incredibly frustrating. So, I don't know. That, I don't even know why I've shared that. But, anyway. Let me know if you think the world's going to end. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let me know if you think you're better than the boomers. If you're a zoomer or a millennial, are you better than a boomer? Or are the boomers, are the boomers right about our shitty generation? And then what about the iPad generation? I'm not even going to call them. I don't even know what they're, they're supposed to be called, like Gen X or something. But I'm just going to call them the iPad generation because my friend came up with that. Or maybe, maybe, maybe he didn't. I don't know. But... I thought, I thought it was genius, like the basically a generation raised by iPads instead of by parents. So anyway, thanks for watching. I will uh, see you guys next time. Peace out.